Welcome into the New Orleans Saints podcast. You'll hear from players, coaches, broadcasters, and writers that cover the NFL on a daily basis. The New Orleans Saints podcast starts right now. Here's your host, Aaron Summers. Welcome into the New Orleans Saints podcast. I'm Aaron Summers. Today, we are going to start our NFL draft coverage. We are only a few short weeks away as the draft takes place April 25th through 27th. And a lot of the talk going into this draft has focused on the quarterbacks because it looks like we're definitely going to have three go one, two, three, possibly four in the top five. There's only been three quarterbacks taken in the first three picks of the draft twice in the past 25 years. However, it looks like there could be that fourth with the number five pick which has never happened. There has never been a draft with four quarterbacks taken in the top five. In last year's draft, there were three quarterbacks that were chosen in the top four, Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, and then Anthony Richardson. In 2021, the top three picks were also all quarterbacks, Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, and Trey Lance. There have been four drafts in league history in which at least five QBs were selected in the entire first round. So we're really looking at uncharted territory and it decides a lot of what's gonna happen with the rest of the draft. Now the Saints won't be getting in on that action. They have nine picks. The first one is the number 14th overall selection. And then they head to the second round with the 45th. They won't pick again until the fifth round with the 150th. So while they could go quarterback, it's not going to be in the first round, considering they got their quarterback in Derek Carr last season. But if you just go back to some of those names that I listed, it is not a sure thing that just because you draft somebody one, two or three, that they're going to produce and they're going to be your next franchise quarterback. It is a lot to risk. However, the way that the CBA was changed in 2011, first round picks became less expensive because each draft pick now has a specific cost to find in advance and that's regardless of position. Today John DeShazer and myself are going to bring in one of the best to do it as far as draft analysis goes in Matt Miller. He works for ESPN. He has been putting out a ton of content, mock drafts, analysis of the quarterbacks, other position players. We're going to pick his brain a little bit about the QBs and of course, throw in some Saints questions as well. Here is Matt now. Matt, thank you so much for joining us on the New Orleans Saints podcast. I know this is a very busy time for you as we are finally gearing up two weeks or so away from the NFL draft. How are you doing? I'm good. Uh, two weeks away, uh, it's like you're, you're cramming. It's like studying for finals <laughs> all over again, you know, <laughs> trying to make sure that I, ha I will legitimately have nightmares this time of year that a player gets drafted and I don't know who they are. So <laughs> it's like you have that anxiety. It's like it is really like being back in school again. So uh, it's it's a great time of year. It's busy. It's so fun, though. Like it, it almost you feel like you're doing a, like a, a U.S. tour of like I get to talk to you guys about the Saints and then I'll go from here and I get to talk to like the Falcons people. And it's it's so much fun to get to kind of hear, you know, what each fan base and each team is is thinking about and talking about before the draft, though. I'm glad you mentioned us before the Falcons. Appreciate that. Of course. How yeah. many players have you done research on or prepared for? I know this answer because I just got off a call, a production call. I'm at 451 players right now. And it, what's weird is that's kind of a low number. I know like we're, we're like, that's a lot of players. It is. But this is kind of a lighter draft class because of that 2020 COVID year. There are some players still taking advantage of that year of eligibility. Because of NIL, there's a lot of players who went back to school who may have traditionally entered the draft. I think we only had 54 underclassmen enter the draft this year. It, it used to be like 120 every year. So it, it's kind of a, a lighter draft class. So that has saved me a little bit. That In a normal year, I might have six or 700 players to know. So 451. Uh, so if any agents hear this and you have a player you think might get drafted, send me their name, please. Because uh, <laughs> trying, to, trying to expand that list. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's all going to start with the quarterbacks this year. Obviously, there's three at the very top, but could be four in the top five. Why do you think that it's just so heavy on the quarterbacks this season? Yeah, I think it's it's twofold. I think some of that is that we've seen great players at the position. Caleb Williams, we've known for three years, was going to be a very high draft pick from, from the moment that he came in in the second quarter against Texas in that Red River Red River rivalry game, excuse me, and, and replacements of Rattler, you could see like how special he was. 
Um, we've known that J.J. McCarthy was a really, really good quarterback. We weren't sure if it was going to be this year or next year before he entered. And then to see the development of guys like Jaden Daniels, to see the development of Bo Nix and Michael Penix Jr., all three as transfer players who are five-year or more players in college football, to watch those guys elevate their games, I think is a big part of it. So this year is like you have those two things colliding of – we have the the usual suspects, you know, those like four or five star recruits who have great college careers and, you, you know, for a year or more, they're going to be the guy. And then we also have these great transfer players who've really, really exceeded and excelled and, and now are in the mix as, as first or second round picks. Matt, I've got to ask, you do the film work from regular season for players and you, you base the status on that and then. You have the combine and the you know pro days and you know personal workouts and quarterbacks move uh, from you yeah. know they'll, they'll climb one way or the other. How does that happen in the off season more so than off off game film? I guess. Yeah, John, I asked that question. I was a young evaluator, and I asked the GM that question. It's like you got to explain this to me because I watched this guy all season, you know, and he said quarterbacks are evaluated from January until the the pick starts, until the clock starts for the first round of the draft. And so like we had a long conversation about that and it's like the game film matters. It really truly does. But until you get a chance to take that player out of the system, basically it's, it's harder to evaluate them. And so you want to get to know more than any other position, personality, work ethic, drive, aptitude, all those things matter. And so we can have a quarterback like, J.J. McCarthy, who I think when the season ended was like, hey, this is probably a mid to late first round pick because of, you know, pro day workouts, private interviews, the need at the position, guys get elevated up. And I think, you know, we even saw that last year with Anthony Richardson. Anthony was this incredibly uniquely talented quarterback prospect who was very, very raw. He had started like, what, 18 games in college, something like that. It was, it was a very low number. But we saw throughout the process him just skyrocket and ended up being the number four overall pick in the draft. And so I think we see it every year now because of the import of that position, you have to get a young quarterback. And because the rookie wage scale, it's not as expensive as it used to be to do that. It's not cost prohibitive where, you know, if you drafted a quarterback early 10 years ago and you missed your salary cap was done, you know, and people were getting fired. You miss now it's like, okay, well, it's going to hurt a little bit, but it's, it's okay. Like we can move on. So I think a lot of those factors have combined to where we do see that quarterback rise a little bit, but it is a, it's fascinating. It's something that I try to self scout as well to go back and look of, okay, this was that player that maybe artificially rose to some degree in the pre-draft process, like Zach Wilson, you know, it's like, what, what allows that to happen? And then does it work out? Because if it works out, no one cares, right? Uh, but if it doesn't, then I think that's where we have to evaluate and say, like, how does this happen? Why does this happen? And how can we be better at evaluating these players? You know, speaking of needing a quarterback or wanting a quarterback, um, I kind of already know how you feel about the Saints in that situation. But, you know, just tell us why you feel the way you feel about the Saints in that situation, because you do have them selecting a quarterback. Yeah, I do. And I, I think, you know, obviously Derek Carr is a good quarterback. He is also an expensive quarterback. So that situation is, you know, they are, they are held together for at least another season, at least from my understanding of things and based on where we're at in the process, it certainly seems that way. But I would always be looking ahead. And I, I recently had this conversation with some friends, actually, and it was like, if you don't have a Patrick Mahomes or a Josh Allen or a Joe Burrow, you have to. Like, you have to find that guy because that's what it's going to take to win a Super Bowl right now. Even having someone who is a top 15 quarterback – right now is not good enough. You know, we can look at so many teams in the NFL where unless you have, you know, a perfect culmination of a great roster and a really good quarterback, then, you, then you're then you okay not having a great quarterback. But I think if you're any, any NFL team who is probably outside the top five or six at the position, you should be taking a swing in the bat every other year on a quarterback. Now, maybe not in the first or second round, but absolutely in the fifth, sixth, seventh round, who knows when you're going to need a Brock Purdy. You know, who knows when you're going to need, you know, even Jalen Hurts was a second round pick as a backup. Dak Prescott was a third round pick as a backup. Those guys are starters who consistently make the playoffs now. So I think for every front office, let's go back to that Ron Wolf way of thinking when he was the general manager of the Green Bay Packers of I'm drafting a quarterback every other year because you never know when you're going to need them. You never know when you're going to strike it rich on one. And best case scenario, you can actually trade them. It's the one position where the return on investment actually usually goes up. 
So I, I think it's just smart practice to always have something churning on the back end as well. That philosophy worked very well for Ron Wolf. <laughs> and maybe <laughs> yeah, for, right. You know, and maybe for some other NFL teams. I, I've got to ask you this. A seven-round draft, how do you pick a player in each round for a team? I, I understand it's, you know, it's yeah. kind of, you know, a, not not so much a guessing game. It's an educated guessing game. But how do you pick yeah. a player for an entire for an entire draft? Yeah, so it's it's a lot of just being organized, honestly. And I've been doing this a long time. You know, I started with Bleach Report in 2010. I was doing it for fun my entire life before that. So I have a lot of experience doing this and you learn how to help yourself do the job. So I try to stay incredibly organized on team needs, not just for this year, but future team needs, because a lot of teams draft a year or two ahead. I try to stay organized on scheme fits. You know, what, what type of offense do the Saints run? What type of defense do the Saints run? Who are those coaches? What is, you know, some of their background? You know, looking at, you know, the types of players that Mickey Loomis likes and how aggressive they are trading. So try to factor all that in. And so it's a lot of, it is a lot of team need because historically teams do draft that way. It's also a lot of what is the prototype for this team? What do they traditionally try to draft and go about it that way? But I will sit down at my desk and basically put myself on the clock. And it's like, all right, one, one Chicago bears. This player comes off the board. All right. One, two Washington commanders. This player comes off the board and try to do it that way. So there's no, there's no favoritism. I'm not like, you know, Oh, let me make sure this team gets this player. It's truly going down the board and, and looking at team needs and best fits and best values. You know, being a draft analyst, is it a thankless job? I mean, is do people remember the hits <laughs> more than they meant remember the misses? Or, you know, is there a, a, no, a balance they, there? <laughs> they is it remember like, like the a misses. Weather, ran, weather man? Yes, <laughs> it is. It absolutely is. I use that analogy all the time of it's a lot like a weatherman because it is an educated prediction of what will happen. And But things can change. You know, I'll never forget right in my mouth saying the 49ers were going to draft Mac Jones because when they traded up, you know, it was, they're going to take Mac Jones. Of course we had about six weeks and they changed their mind and they took Trey Lance. So you have to, you have to learn when to jump on the table and say, Hey, this is going to happen or this player is going to be this or that, but it is, it's a lot of, it's a lot of forecasting. It really is. So yeah. And like your local weather, man, you're loved if you're right and you're hated if you're wrong. So it's, it's a fun job though. You know, what's the background on this now? You, you mentioned Bleacher Report, but what makes a person want to be a draft analyst? What, what's the genesis yeah. of that? I need to ask my parents and my older brother <laughs> that question because I don't, the honest, honest truth, I don't remember a time of my life when I was not obsessed with the NFL draft. You know, I grew up uh, in the, the sa southern Midwest where everybody goes to church three times a week. The two Sundays I could miss were for the Super Bowl and the NFL draft back when it was on Saturdays and Sundays. That was it. So I'm talking, I'm like eight years old and, you know, begging my parents to let me stay home to watch the NFL draft. So, you know, when I got into high school, I knew I wanted to be a journalist and I had a great teacher, Mike Brown, who said, hey, you know, while you're standing on the sidelines during those football games, watching your buddies play, maybe you should be writing about the game since I was a backup at a 1A high school. He was like, you know, maybe uh, obviously you have a passion for football and you also have a passion for writing. Let's put those two things together. And so he put that bug in my ear and you know, it's great now to call Mel Kuyper Jr. a colleague when he's been a person really my entire life that I've looked up to. And, and you know, he blazed the trail for people like me to even have a job. So it's I think that lifelong fascination with people don't believe this story, but I, I have backup on it. My mom is from Michigan, so I grew up watching University of Michigan games. And a huge thing for me was not understanding why Tom Brady wasn't seen as better. And I know that everybody has like their Tom Brady story, but truly like and. You know, I grew up a Texas fan. So watching Major Applewhite, be like, well, okay, wait, I watched these guys dominate on Saturdays. Why are they not good NFL players? Why are they not valued by NFL teams? And even before those guys, you know, I was, I was a teenager by that point. But there were so many of those players where I'm a little kid watching, like, well, I don't understand why this player is great on Saturday and not valued by NFL teams. So I, I do think that's a, a big part of what made me fall in love with the draft so early. Yeah, uh, J.D. alluded to it earlier about uh, the Saints selecting a quarterback. And if you go down some of the mock drafts you've done, it's in the fifth round, 150 pick. They pick Michael Pratt out of Tulane, which is a really cool tie. Is that why you made that selection? Is that just kind no, of how it felt? No, it wasn't. I promise it wasn't. It was like, again, it was going <laughs> through like the fits and the styles. And after the fact, I was like, oh, yeah. Tulane uh, being in being in New Orleans uh, so it wasn't intentional but sometimes it just works out like that but I think you know his accuracy from within the pocket is is it's a lot like a Derek Carr it's a lot like 
you know, even I'm not comparing him to Drew Brees, but like it's that ability to like win with touch and win with accuracy. He's incredibly experienced. He has good mobility. And he's one of those players that, again, like there's that Brock Purdy factor to him. of Like you're incredibly experienced. You're accurate. You're smart. You will do what you're told to some degree. Like he's not a freelancer. He's going to run. He's going to go out there and run the offense. And so I think we do see more teams wanting that with their, you know, late round quarterback of let's take a shot on a guy who was productive, experienced, smart, accurate, and he's going to do what we tell him to do, you know, and, and not be a player that's, you know, trying to extend the play every time. And, and they're just, they're, you know, a little bit more robotic, but sometimes that's a good thing. And w- wait, how on earth can you be a draft guru and not know that the Saints are supposed to pick an LSU player? Because that's what <laughs> right <laughs> every year, right? Yeah, every uh, year. <laughs> you have Tyron Matthew, so that covers the basics, right? He's the ultimate LSU player, so it's good. But uh, it, you know, that's very much in play this year. I think you know we we don't have as many high end LSU players this year. Um, obviously, outside of the quarterback and the two wide receivers, they will mo- they will be gone by the time the Saints pick. I think. But, uh, yeah, I, I think we'll – especially I start to look at next year, as there'll be a lot of LSU players that we'll be talking about for 2025 with the Saints too. Well, talking about some of those LSU players, obviously quarterback Jaden Daniels going to go in the top three. Where do you feel like he is going to fall? Because there's been a lot of talk about maybe Drake May jumping him, going second. Yeah, I think number two is the most likely spot. I would say, like, feel like 75% good on the Washington Commanders at number two. I just think – and maybe I'm over connecting the dots here, but I just, he's such a good fit for what Cliff Kingsbury likes to do offensively. And I understand an offensive coordinator is pretty far down the the order in terms of who's going to call the shot on the draft pick, especially at number two overall, but that does factor in. And you hire Cliff Kingsbury for a reason because you like his offense, you like his scheme. So you want to give him the the player that can run that. I think, you know, Drake may and JJ McCarthy are fantastic quarterbacks, but that dual threat ability has been a, a staple for Kingsbury going back to Patrick Mahomes at Texas Tech or even, you know, Kyler Murray being his hand-picked guy with the Arizona Cardinals one year after they trade up to draft Josh Rosen. And so I I think looking at the mobility factor of Jaden, but also the experience factor, and and you talked about that a little bit with Michael Pratt, it does matter. You know, this is one of the few teams that didn't really backstop at the backup position. In fact, they traded Sam Howell, you know, and so it's a matter of they need someone that could come in and play right away. And I think with Drake May being a two-year player, J.J. McCarthy being a two-year starter, like, the fact that Jaden has six years of quarterback experience, that that absolutely matters. And also behind an offensive line that is still being put together, I would want Jaden Daniels running back there more than I would want any any of the other quarterbacks who are likely to be available. Are you picking up on, you know, Oregon quarterback Bo Nix or Washington quarterback Michael Penix Jr. moving up to the first round, or you think they're they're solid seconds? I think it's possible, not on not on like where I would rank the player. But mm-hmm. based on need, as you know, we were talking about that earlier of the Denver Broncos are sitting there at 12 and I watched every team in the NFL feels like add a quarterback except for the Denver Broncos. And they have Jared Stidham and Ben DiNucci. No disrespect to either player, but it does feel like they're in a spot where they need to add a quarterback. I mean, you guys know Sean Payton and his love of the quarterback position. He's going to be hard on whomever he gets at that spot. And so I, I think you can look at Bo Nix, understanding, you know, his background. At, his dad was a football player. He had to battle some adversity being at his dad's alma mater at Auburn early in his career behind, you know, a bad offensive line without a lot of playmakers, the struggle there to then leave and go to Oregon and reinvent himself. I could see Sean Payton falling in love with that. It's tough though. 12 is early for Bo Nix in my opinion, but you know, I heard Sean McDermott say this at the combine. If you swing on a player and you hit, no one remembers if you drafted them early or traded too much to get them. They just remember that you hit. And so if you take Bo Nix at 12, folks like myself are going to say, that was way too early. But if he becomes a 12-year starter, no one's going to care. Yeah, because a lot of people are saying, as you mentioned earlier with McCarthy, being that the next QB that goes and would be a possible person to go to the Broncos. Overall, they're looking at the Saints and what some of their needs are. They don't tend to draft four needs. They like to go, but best right. available. But I, I think we have a few needs this year. So what do you think that they will address? Yeah, I, I'm with you. I think this is the year to address those needs because they do match up with the value of what's expected to be on the board. It's like looking at the offensive tackle position, you know, Trevor Penning has not become the player that his draft stock would have indicated that he would become. So Ryan Ramchek with the injuries, like those are areas where 
those question marks would have me looking at an offensive tackle if one happened and, and one should be on the board. It's a very, very good offensive tackle class. So that would be in play for me. I think defensive tackle is always an area where you want to build through the trenches. You can never have too many pass rushers. We've seen three technique pass rusher salaries just blow up this past year. And so uh, I think offensive tackle in the first round is, is the best value uh, for them and also the best need. And then looking at, you know, filling out defensive tackle, uh, I would add a quarterback at some point, like we talked about, I would add a wide receiver probably earlier than later in this draft as well. Yeah. Matt, when you're talking about these quarterbacks and maybe not necessarily Caleb Williams or, or maybe, you know, maybe not Jaden Daniels, but I guess for some of them, how much important is the infrastructure of the team to give yeah. them a success? Because most of these guys are going to be on the field pretty early. Yeah, it's huge. And I've, I've made this argument multiple times that, you know, teams like the New England Patriots are in a very different position than teams like the New Orleans Saints would be or the Minnesota Vikings. You know, Minnesota and Chicago are great examples of teams that have set the table really well for a rookie quarterback to come in. We just saw this play out last year where we all believed the Carolina Panthers were a great landing spot for a rookie quarterback. That did not work. People got fired and there have been massive changes there because they didn't have the infrastructure set up. Then you look at the Houston Texans and you see they had three first round picks on their offensive line and multiple second round picks. They had a quarterback's coach and offense coordinator, Bobby Slowick, who built a scheme for the player as opposed to trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. They drafted well at wide receiver. They added a veteran tight end in Dalton Schultz, who was such a great safety valve. And you see how much that infrastructure benefited CJ Stroud. So that is one of my favorite words to use this time of year because it absolutely matters. And it will forever be the debate of what do you do first? Do you build the team first or do you add the quarterback and then build the team around him? And I think when doing that, if you if you go quarterback first, it's obviously the most important position in sports. You have to make sure you get the right player that can handle getting beat up for a year or two while you build the team around him. You know, we've seen Trevor Lawrence have some ups and downs with Jacksonville because they went, you know, the, the model of quarterback first. But then you have guys like Joe Burrow and C.J. Stroud who immediately – elevated the teams around them and made them playoff contenders. You know, that's a really good point because CJ Stroud definitely going to, it seemed like he has done better, been in a better situation. There's a lot of players out there that got drafted very high, like Ryan Leaf and Jamarcus Russell, who, who didn't pan yeah. out. So it's, it's always exciting when the draft comes to see where everybody goes and how their first rookie season ends up. But who do you think is, is going to be set up for the most success? Yeah, I, I do think Caleb Williams in Chicago, they have done such a great job and an underrated job. I don't know that that has been talked about enough. You know, even going back a year ago, the trade that brought in DJ Moore. And now you add Keenan Allen, who's such a smart veteran player. You know, they have done well on the offensive line. Darnell Wright last year. Uh, I think they found a steal in Braxton Jones, who's their left tackle. Um, DeAndre Swift in the backfield with, with Roshan Johnson. You have Cole Komet and Gerald Everett at tight end. And a defense that's really good as well. And, you know, the trade last year to net Montez Sweat was huge for them. So I, I think they've done a brilliant job of building that infrastructure first and also having the foresight last year to make the trade with Carolina. There were a lot of teams that wanted the number one overall pick, but for Ryan Poles, the GM, to say, you know, we like the situation that Carolina's in to where they, they might be selecting pretty highly again next year. So that foresight to pick the right team to trade with, you know, the Houston Texans wanted that pick too. Uh, things would look very different for Chicago right now if they were selecting at nine and 23 overall instead of one and nine. So uh, I think they've done a great job. And, and that is a really, really good environment for for Caleb once they select him. Well, I definitely appreciate all of your insight and you spending some time in this is a busy time of the year for you. It's, it's always fun to listen to you kind of break it down. So appreciate it. Yeah, of course, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Matt. Really appreciate the time from Matt. Tons of great information. As I mentioned, you can go to ESPN.com and see everything that he does there. He'll be working his tail off, I am sure, all the way through draft week in April 25th through 27th. Next week, we're going to start breaking down all of the division rivals. So we'll hit on the Panthers, Falcons, and Bucks and what some of their needs are. And then the week following, which will be draft week, we will dissect and dive into everything Saints related. Thank you so much for joining us on the New Orleans Saints podcast today, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for listening to the New Orleans Saints podcast. Join us three times per week on NewOrleansSaints.com, the Saints mobile app, or you can download the podcast on iTunes. 
We'll see you next time right here on the New Orleans Saints podcast.